Hi, well, good morning, friends. Hey, uh, this is Brother Mike. I'm back on the podcast. Thank you for tuning in today. It's nine o'clock in Arizona. It's nine o'clock on the West Coast. And uh, I hope you were able to catch my radio show if you happen to be here locally in Maricopa County. I'm on at eight o'clock every Sunday morning on um, 1100 AM. That's a conservative talk radio station, but I they're doing religious programming on Sundays, and I grabbed the 8 a.m. spot when I heard about it. And uh, I go from 8 a.m. on Sunday morning on the radio and then to my podcast at 9 a.m. Remember, you can get a hold of me at Mike at HardcoreChristianity.com if you need to get a hold of me for any reason. If you need a religious exemption, if you need a religious exemption for the flu, or the COVID vaccines. Mike at hardcorechristianity.com will send it right out to you. You can have your pastor sign the form or you can uh, forge my name on it if you want to. Just put Michael W. Smith on the form there. Arizona Deliverance Center, no problemo. But anyway, if you need an exemption, please send me an email today. I'll mail it out today. You'll get it today. Uh, I taught a, a very controversial subject yesterday at the deliverance training class on the fourth Saturday of every month. I have a training class at the uh, Arizona Deliverance Center. It's in the small sanctuary, sanctuary, not the main sanctuary. And uh, if you uh, go through that teaching, you know, it's going to be controversial. I'm going to take some heat for it, but I was trying to save people's lives is what I was doing. So uh, remember, uh, Trying to have an open mind with it because, you know, it's some nasty material, but it has to be taught. It has to be revealed. And uh, I wasn't trying to hurt or embarrass anybody. I was trying to save people's lives. That was the ultimate purpose of the of the training. So if you'd like to see it, it'll be on my Facebook page, Michael W. Smith. And um, if you happen to be here locally, we have a uh, counseling ministry at the Arizona Deliverance Center. Call me on the ministry line, 602-636-5800. If you need to be scheduled for a counseling, inner healing, and deliverance appointment, there is no charge for any counseling services if you are a born-again Christian, okay? Please remember, we have two Zoom services every week. Both of them are fantastic. Julie does the first one on Monday nights at 630 Rick and Stephanie do the one on Wednesday night at six o'clock. And I mean, these things are the bomb. You, you, you wouldn't believe it. It's just, just amazing what happened. Yesterday at the uh, deliverance training class, at the end of it, I had an altar call. Everybody came up. The Holy Ghost blew through there so fast. That was shocking. I had a very short prayer. Bang, he hit. And literally every person that came down for prayer was going through deliverance, 100% of it. It was amazing. The the uh, ministry team uh, did fantastic. As soon as they see something bubbling, they just run up and then finish it off. It's really great. So if you have a chance to come to the deliverance center or refer somebody there, if I were you, it's a smart move because uh, they have a chance to get delivered and healed. Our Zoom service are it's exactly the same thing. They're no different. Huge anointing. And then please remember our live services every Thursday and Friday night. Brother Rick's up Thursday nights, 7 p.m. Arizona time. Remember, after Halloween, we switch. We we go from uh, Pacific time, so to speak, to mountain time. We don't go on daylight savings time here in Arizona because <laughs> for obvious reason, we don't want to save any daylight here. It is hotter than Hades here during the summer. In fact, we just went through the hottest summer in the history of recording summers in this country, Arizona, I mean, we got cooked last summer. We truly did. It was extremely hot. Don't recommend you visit here during the summer. It's kind of tough. But um, we go to mountain time after Halloween, as you remember. So we will be uh, one hour, one hour uh, ahead of Pacific time or the West Coast, right? And so we'll be uh, two hours, one hour ahead. Central time is an hour away. And then Eastern time is two hours away. 
whereas now it's three hours away. Okay, so that, you, you'll need that for the Zoom services and the uh, youtube.com slash AZ. Those are our live services are broadcast there. I'll be teaching this Friday at the Deliverance Center at 7 p.m. And we will be ready to go. Hey, I wanted to share something interesting with you today. A couple of case studies you'll find uh, very interesting. Let's check it out. Uh, the Holy Ghost uh, put these two stories together. Absolute masterpiece. Divine genius. That's that's the only thing you can say about him. As you remember, in Mark chapter 10, verse 13, here we have the incident where uh, parents... Parents who, as you know, love their kids more than they even love themselves. A lot of parents do. Obviously, many do not, but particularly mothers. Here they are again. They, they, the mothers brought their kids to Jesus. It says in uh, verse 13, they brought their young children. So the Greek word was paideon. That would be like a grade schooler, a, a young kid, a very young kid. Not, not an infant or a toddler. That's a different Greek word. Pideon is a young kid, a young child. And, he, and he, they wanted Jesus to touch their kids because they recognized him as the Holy Son of God. Well, when they brought the kids, the disciples then turned into religious kooks and rebuked the parents for causing a disruption, for interrupting whatever was going on and so on. And what's amazing was the Greek word for rebuke there is pitamao, was the same Greek word used to rebuke demons. So they weren't just making a suggestion that their parents, you know, hold on to their kids. They were rebuking the parents. I command you, how dare you? They rebuked the parents for bringing them to Jesus. And that's why the next sentence makes sense. And it says, Jesus saw it and he was much displeased. He was much displeased. Anganateo is the Greek word for displeased there. It means he was agitated. He was indignant. So they are rebuking these parents, blasting them, and Jesus is getting angry in a way over it indignant over it and he says to them allow the little children to come to me Pideon, the good the, the fourth graders third grader something like that a, a sixth grader allow them to come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of god and i say to you whoever shall not receive the kingdom of god as a Pideon, the fourth grader fifth grader whatever they will not enter the kingdom of God. And it says he picked the kids up and blessed them. Right after that, the Holy Spirit is tying this thing in brilliantly. It's gorgeous. The rich young ruler comes forward. What are these two stories doing? They're tremendous illustrations of human carnality. The carnal aspects of humanity that we are supposed to be removing through Romans chapter 12, verse one and two, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse one and two. We are to be transitioning out of our life of carnality into, a, into the spirit world where we are, we are now born again in spirit and we are now spiritual beings, not carnal beings. And so the Holy Ghost is illustrating here the carnality of humans, number one, not being humble and not receiving children for a blessing. Boy, what a metaphor that is for our society now where children are under a monstrous attack in this country. It's unreal what they're doing to children. They're transitioning them from males to females. That, that there couldn't be any worse child abuse. I mean, I thought child abuse was bad when I was a kid. Both my parents were alcoholics. Uh, I thought child abuse was beating a kid with belts too much or, you know, neglecting them or abandoning them. Wow. Child abuse has now gone to another level where you're transitioning a child from being a male to a female. 
you're actually a female. Okay, we're going to send you in with puberty blockers. We're going to cut your genitals off. We're going to try to make some kind of a makeshift vagina down there. What are you doing? Well, what they're doing is this is the monster. This is Satan. Only Satan mutilates kids like that. Nobody else does. Humans don't do that. This isn't a human thing. This is him. Verse 17. When Jesus left, there came one running to him. He was running to him. Okay, that's good. Very positive. Uh, that's what you want to do today. Run to Jesus. That's what you want others to do. Run to him. Brilliant. This guy's on off to a great start. Then he kneels down to Jesus. Oh, another great start. Fantastic. That's what we need to do. That's what others need to do. Couldn't be any better. This guy's out the gate. And I mean like secretariat. He's heading down the, the track. Brilliant. Then he says to him, now he starts to oops. He says, good master. Okay. Didaskalos is a Greek word for master there. It means teacher. So this guy who knelt down in front of him didn't see him as God, but saw him as a teacher. He said, what shall I do that I might inherit, inherit eternal life? Inheritances require the inherent E to do something. So the guy's coming to Jesus and doesn't recognize him that he's God, sees him only as a teacher, and then, then wants to know how he can earn eternal life. And Jesus said to him, why are you calling me good? No one's good, but God. And here you go. Brilliant response. Okay. If you see Jesus as a teacher, like the Muslims, like the Hindus, like the Buddhists, you are not going to be saved. And we're going to carry your sins and the next life you will face damnation and judgment. You have to come to Jesus and see him. See him what? As God, you have to come to Jesus and see him as God. He is God. So Jesus says to him, he answers this question just like the guy asked him. Same thing. He says to him, you know the commandments. How do you know that? I don't know. He just says, you know the commandments. Well, he could see this guy was probably an orthodox Jew, a practicing Jew, a dedicated Jew. And he says, he runs down a few of the Ten Commandments, you know, adultery, lying, defrauding, honor your father and mother, that kind of thing. He runs down the list and the guy says to him, teacher, all these things I have observed from being a child, from when I was young. And Jesus said, it says here in verse 21, which is fantastic, Jesus beholding him, okay, emblepo is the Greek word. It means to stare intently at him. And Jesus is staring intently at this rich young ruler. And it says he loved him. The Greek word for love there is the verb agapao from the noun agape. <clears throat> that means that Jesus was showing his love for this rich young ruler. How was he doing that? By telling him the truth. Okay. Since I've been in the ministry, low these decades, whatever it is, I have always tried to show my love for people. And one of the ways I did it was to tell them the truth. The only way to help someone is to give them truth. You have to give it to them, even if you have to take the heat for it, even if they get upset, even if they're hurt. You got to present it in the most gentle light you can, or you must be stern with it when it's required. Either way, you must learn that if you're going to be in the ministry, or if you actually love someone, you have to be truthful with them. Truth is a sign of love. And Jesus was getting his love to the guy, Agapao, by telling him the truth. He says, one thing you're lacking, 
What was he doing? The guy violated number 10 on the 10 commandments. Covetousness. Thou shalt not covet anything that is your neighbor's. And Jesus says to him, you're lacking one thing. Go back home. Go your way, it says. Sell whatever you have. And the Greek word for have there is echo. It means to grip something tightly. Echo would be the term you would use if, if you went up to bat. Okay, you don't grab the bat loosely. You echo, you grip it. And it says, whatever you have, whatever you're gripping and holding on to, mentally or emotionally or financially, give it to the poor. And you will have treasure where? In heaven. Then he says, come and take up the cross. Okay, the Greek word for take up there is iro. It means get rid of, pick up and get rid of what is blocking you from the cross of Calvary. And in this guy's case, it was covetousness. He had a large estate. He liked money. He liked material things. He felt comforted by it. And he was gripping it, echo. He was holding on to it. And Jesus saw that clearly and wanted to help the guy and love him. So he gave him truth. And then it says, verse 22, the guy was sad. He was sad. Stugnagdo is the Greek word that means to have gloom come over you. Not so gloomy came over him and he went away grieved blue pale he went away depressed why because he had echo he was gripping great possessions katema katema he had a huge estate and he was holding on to it spiritually emotionally mentally Jesus then looked around after the guy slumped off. And he says, verse 23, how hardly, how hardly shall they that have echo that are gripping and holding on to riches, riches, crema, riches, wealth, material things, money, what have you, wealth. Gripping it, you're gripping it. It's a heart condition. They will hardly ever enter into the kingdom of God. And his disciples were shocked, it says. They were absolutely shocked. When he said it, they couldn't believe it. Stunned. And it says, in fact, they were astonished out of measure. That means that they were Stunned as if they saw God. That's what it says there. Stunned as if they saw God out of measure. Saying among themselves, who in the world can be sozo? Who can be saved? Who can be delivered? If this is the case. And Jesus looked on them and said, with men, it's impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. And then Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man, echo, gripping his wealth and money and riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's impossible. The Greek word for needle there, rafis, means a little sewing needle. What Jesus was doing was saying something that visually, imaginationally, was obviously absurd. There's no possible way, there's no possible way a gigantic camel could go through an, an eye on a, on a needle, thread, a sewing needle, rafis. Okay, well, no, Brother Mike, that's symbolic of the eye of the needle, a gate in Jerusalem. That's a false story. That's, that's a lie. There is no gate in Jerusalem. Eye of the Needle Gate, that was all fabricated. That was a conspiracy theory. There is no gate in Jerusalem. This 
what Jesus said is exactly what he meant. It's impossible for human beings gripping our lives, holding on to our lives, money, wealth, material things, people, loved ones, pets, gripping, whatever. Why? The first commandment. I am the Lord your God. You will have no other gods before me. Paul told the Corinthians that covetousness was the same as idolatry. So what we've got here is this rich young ruler whom Jesus loved, by the way. And he showed his love to him by telling him the truth. This rich young ruler was lost. Like trying to push a camel an 800 pound camel through an eye of a sewing needle. It's impossible to do it. Then after that, Peter panics and Peter pipes up. And that's what Peter normally does, pipes up. He had a big mouth, he runs his mouth like a busted chain, so I talked all the time. So he starts talking again, he says, hey, Look, we've left everything. Now he's sitting there thinking about the rich young ruler losing everything by being lost and dying and going to hell. And when you die, everybody knows you don't take your wealth with you. You don't take your friends with you. You don't take your pets with you. Nobody goes with you. You go through alone. You transition over there alone. That's it. It's you and God. After you die, when you make that transition, there's nobody around for counseling. Brother Mike's not going to be there for a counseling session. Nobody's going to be there with me. I'm transitioning over alone out of this life into the next one. So Peter panics. He says, man, if that guy's going to have nothing, I need to reinforce my hopes that I'm going to be a rich person. And then he pipes up and he says, hey, we left everything. And we have followed you. We left everything. Wow. And then Jesus says something incredible. There's no one that left their house or their brethren or sisters, fathers, mothers, wives, children, lands, for my sake and the gospels, but will we'll receive a hundredfold. Now in this present time, houses, brethren, sisters, wives, children, lands, persecutions, with persecutions, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Now, Matthew adds, adds the sentence that Mark left out in this story. Matthew added it. It says in Matthew 19, verse 28, this should have been added in the Mark story. Verily I say to you, you that have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on his throne in the regeneration, in the regeneration, what does that mean? Pangalagesia, in the rebirth, when we transition out of this life into the next one, and we are resurrected from the dead, as Jesus was, who was the first fruits of the resurrection. When we are resurrected from the de dead with our brand new glorious bodies, thank God for that. Mine's getting old and worn out. I can't wait to replace it. In the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on his throne, you will sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So now you can see here, putting this whole thing in context. Just because you're serving God doesn't mean you're going to get rid of your wife and then get another wife. It doesn't mean you're going to uh, keep your wife and then add more wives. Okay, polygamy is something the Mormons do. It's satanic. Okay, we don't do that. You're not going to get dozens of houses, dozens of cars, dozens of... That's not what he's talking about. He was talking about the glories and wealth and the incredible blessings you will receive as you transition out of this life into the next one. But the point of the stories was you had the carnality of the kids 
then you had the carnality of covetousness. You shall have no other gods before me. Paul said covetousness was idolatry. If you are coveting something in this life and you're putting it above your love for God, what is it? Husband, wife, kids, pets, money, houses, retirement, whatever it is, whatever it is in this life that you are coveting, you are committing idolatry. Okay, we're supposed to put the Lord Jesus here and everything else goes under that. That's our process. And if you want to be in the ministry and you want the moving of the Holy Ghost, you want to see the spirit moving. It's an absolute requirement. How do we know that? Jesus put in a period of time of fasting, and then he had to go out and face the devil face to face. Now, I could never do that in a million years, face the devil face to face. I get clobbered, but Jesus did it. What was he doing there? He was preparing himself for his Holy Ghost ministry. After he overcame the temptations, initially facing the devil, he then went to the Jordan River. That's where you got to go. You got to go down to the Jordan. And there, the great John the Baptist met him and baptized him. That's where you got to go. You got to go to the, get baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's, that's your call right there. That's what God calling you to do. Not coveting material things, not gripping stuff in this life, gripping it. You can have stuff. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no sin being wealthy, rich, or having material things. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story was echo, gripping things in this life, holding on to it. God Almighty. It's a, let me tell you something, it's an anointing killer. It's an anointing killer. Yeah, all the great Holy Ghost preachers, every single one of them. Started out initially, very humble people, givers. They didn't hold on to things in this world. Echo, they didn't grip it like the rich young ruler. How, how impossible is it for those who have grip, echo, have money and wealth and material things to enter the kingdom of heaven? They can't do it. It's like having a full-grown camel at the zoo go through a knitting needle eye. It's not possible. It's impossible. It cannot happen. But if you release it, Jesus went on to say, essentially, that the more you will receive. Yeah. Because deep down, here's what your heart is. Here, here's, here you are. Let me tell you about you. You would really like to live a sinless life. You'd like to sanctify yourself. You'd like to be holy. And you would like to help others. Yes, you would. And that's what you really want to do. You know, you've reached a certain age now where you're saying to yourself, man, this is a fleeting world. And these carnal things, I've had some of them. I've lost some of them. I was some of them. And now I see it now. I'm starting to recognize my mortality, my mortality. And that's a good thing to recognize your mortality. It's a good thing to realize that you're going to be dead soon. You know why? It sets a fire of urgency in your soul that you want to accompany something for God. Because everything the rich young ruler had, as you know, when he died, he would have no rewards in heaven. None. You know, you can accumulate everything in life. You take a look at these billionaires. They're the sickest, most pitiful things you've ever seen in your life. It's absolutely insane the guy that runs facebook oh my gosh can you believe that that poor guy wow elon musk oh god can you believe that guy poor guy wow they dropped dead you know what they have nothing they had everything in life a human being could possibly have they dropped dead they have a heart attack. And they're standing there with nothing. They have literally nothing. 
in the second life? Nothing. And Jesus will tell him that kid, look, you need to look at your mortality. You look at your, take a look at your life circumspectly. You need to see yourself from the beginning to the end here. And you need to recognize that you're going to be dead soon. And that's true of all human beings. I mean, human beings don't live very long, do they? No, and they're old before you, I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's like, I'm old. I mean, I can literally remember decades ago when I was doing stuff when I was a young man. I don't know, like it was yesterday, I can remember. Now I'm an old man. Unbelievable. Your life is like a vapor, the Bible says, as you know. It's like a flower fading in the field. That's exactly true. And so you, you need to do what Brother Paul said, redeem the time. You need to redeem the time. The rich young ruler wasn't redeeming his time. He, he was too focused on carnal things. Okay, The disciples who kicked the kids out and rebuked the parents, they were not redeeming their time. They were not doing, they were not storing up treasures in heaven, like Jesus said. Come follow me and you will have treasures in heaven. See, that's where the real wealth is. And everybody that understands that and gets that, they save their lives. And when they die, their, their lives have real value. This rich young ruler, Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, you know, and, you know, uh, multiple millions of other rich people, they're all the same. They die in poverty. They're broke. They're broke. Sam Walton right now, richest man to ever live, probably. Burning in hell, screaming right now as I'm speaking to you. I mean, if he did a podcast, everybody would faint. Anybody who saw his podcast would faint. He's screaming in hellish agony. This guy was just massively rich and a, and a good person, very likable person, good people. Most of people in hell are good people. Most of them. The majority of them, over 50% of the people now are good people. They wasted their lives. Why echo? They were in the they had they were gripping onto carnal worldly things. Romans 12, Hebrews 12, carnal worldly things, and they were being destroyed. And they wasted their life. And then when they died, they had no rewards from God, nothing of value. They transitioned over broke. Broke. You can't do that. You cannot be one of those people. You, you just can't do it. You've got to lay up treasures in heaven. That's what he told that rich kid. Dude, come follow me. Sell what you have. And you'll have treasures in heaven. See? Your heavenly treasures are all collected unto you by faith. Okay, I don't see anything right now. I don't know anything right now. And I don't care right now. God's word said, if you follow Christ, come and follow me. Take up your cross. I wrote, get rid of, pick up and get rid of the things that are blocking you from following Christ. That's what that verse really says. It was poorly translated in the King James Bible. Follow me. Take up your cross. Follow me. I roll means to pick up and get rid of it. Your crosses that you're carrying with you are burdens. Right? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. They're burdens that are keeping you from fulfilling your destiny. They are Ignorant, stupid, asinine people, you shouldn't be hanging around anymore. They are imbecilic, idiotic behaviors you should not be engaged in anymore. There are stinking loads of garbage and trash you're hearing or watching that you need to be removed, kind of eliminate that stuff, weed your way through it and get rid of it so that you can lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's what he's talking about. That's what I'm talking about. See? If you keep living your life the way you are, when you transition over to the other side, which will be very soon, 
you're going to be sitting there with a big bag of regrets. Really? Is that how you want to end up? No. Take up your cross and follow me. That's what he told the rich young ruler. The guy went away depressed. Lupeo, he went, he went into a depression when he heard that. Can you imagine that? Because he wanted to inherit. He wanted to follow these rules and inherit eternal life from this teacher. He wanted this teacher to tell him how to inherit eternal life. What do I need to do to get this accomplished? The guy was major league off the track, but the Holy Ghost used that story to save our lives. Our lives are saved because of it. Thank God for that kid. He hit it just right. Yeah. And that's part of life, isn't it? Of course it is. You, you learn from other people's mistakes. They screw up which keeps you from screwing up. It's as simple as that. He screwed up and I saw it. And so I repented and changed. I got rid of my covetous mentality, coveting material things, coveting money, coveting, coveting wealth. I used to be heavy into that. I used to be a multi-millionaire. I'm not anymore, but I used to be. I hunted for it for years. I served the almighty buck. I was a slave to Satan. I did all that. I did all that. I know all about it. I know all about it. But finally, I took up my cross. I roll. I got rid of that stuff. And I'm following Christ and trying to improve as I go. Now, I'm never going to be perfect or just like Jesus. No, that's not going to happen. I'm not saying it's going to happen. But my goal is to follow his standard and see if I can get as close to it as I can before I kick the bucket. That's a medical term. That means to die. And we're all going to die soon. Nobody lives very long. People nowadays just don't live long. Do they? No, they don't. In the Old Testament, that's a different story. They lived hundreds of years or whatever it was. We don't do that anymore. People's lives are very short. You've got to make this thing count. You need to get healed of your mental illness. You need to get healed of your physical illnesses. You need to repent of your sin. You need to change your mindset. You need to renew your mind. Romans 12, Hebrews 12, you need to do it now before it's too late. And it was too late for that rich young ruler. That dude walked off depressed. The teacher gave him information because he loved him. Truth is a sign of love. He gave him information that the kid didn't want. He didn't like it because he had great katema, Greek word, wealth, possessions. An estate is what the actual term is used for that, katema, estate. He had a huge estate. And look, your estate is in heaven, not here. Now, is it a sin to have money and wealth? No, it isn't. See, it's the echo. It's the gripping onto it that's the sin. It's a miracle. It's impossible for someone who grips and holds onto, Jesus said, wealth to get into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished beyond measure. They couldn't believe it. And then they panicked. They said, hey, well, what about our wealth? What's going to happen to us? We, we left everything to serve you. We left our wives. We left our kids. We left the whole kit and caboodle. See how that? That's how Peter panicked. He was scared. You don't need to be scared. That's what Jesus said. You will lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything you need will just be added to you, just be given to you. You don't even need to pray about it. If you're spending all your time praying for your needs, you are a very weak, deceived Christian. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus clearly said, you don't need to pray about your needs. I'll just take care of them. You do my work and you worry about your ministry to me. And I'll get, I'll get all your needs covered. You don't even need to pray about it. Don't pray about that stuff. Pray about stuff that's related to your ministry. 
I'm going to tell you something you're not going to believe. This, I swear it. I started the House of Healing in 2005, and this is 2023. We're at the Deliverance Center now. I have never been late on a bill, ever. Not even one, nothing. I've never been late on a radio bill. I've never been late on any kind of ministry bill, expenses, whatever it is. Renovations to buildings, nothing. Every single thing was covered and paid. People who saw our vision and were kind to us, they sent us money. In all those years, I never taught on tithing. I never taught on giving. And I never asked anybody for money, not one cent. Why? Because I saw it in Matthew. I said, my gosh, what a relief this is. This lifts a burden off my soul. You won't believe. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not mine. Mine sucks. His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And Jesus had explained to you, hey, look at these birds. Yeah, what about them? Well, look, your heavenly father set up a system to feed these birds. Nobody hand feeds them. They all get fed. It's all, it's all set up. Well, God set up a system for you to meet your needs. If you take care of his business first, he'll take care of your business second. He'll come through 100% of the time. There's no question about it. You can't lose. Yeah, you can't lose. Yesterday at the altar call at the Deliverance training class, everybody came up, everybody repented, bang. As soon as you repent, the whole host makes his move. That's the works. And if you'll repent of gripping, echo, holding on to these things in your life, putting your heart into them, okay? If you will repent of your idolatry, which Paul said covetous, which is idolatry, he actually said it, believe it or not. He actually said that. I know, I almost fainted when I read it the first time years ago. What? That's what planted a seed in my soul, saying, hey, Mike, you got to make some major changes. Or you're putting too much emphasis on money, stocks, real estate, but whatever it is. I had all those things, everything. I had to get rid of it. I had to disengage, disengage. I had to change, okay? Brother Mike, I was hoping to tune in today and see a podcast on prosperity, happiness, peace, and joy and abundant life. Okay, you are hearing that, but you're hearing it the truthful way. Why? Because I, I love you and I care about you. I have to tell you the truth. That's what Jesus taught us in this story. He loved him, it says. Jesus looked at him and loved him. He said, I've done all these things from my youth. Uh, that ought to be good enough, right? I'm getting inherited it now. I've earned it, right? And Jesus looked at him with love. So if you failed, if you screwed up, if you are a screw up or a failure, hey, just repent of it because you are a very loved person, even though you make mistakes and even though you sin. You are a very loved person, period. There's no question about it. It specifically says, and you can trust it. So if you'll uh, take up your cross, pick up and get rid of it. I roll. Get it out of there. Pick up your cross and follow me. What's what, what's picking up your cross and getting rid of? Rich young, you let this stuff go. Let it go. Sell it. Give it to the poor, which then will rack up treasures in heaven. That's amazing. Did you know that you get added to your treasure in heaven by doing simple little things if you do it with a sincere and good heart jesus said if you give a cup of water to someone in my name you will not lose your reward well i wasn't expecting to hear this prosperity message from you brother Mike. well you know these these religious tv whores that's all self-gratification. They want another mansion and another limousine. 
I don't get involved in any of that, and neither does the Holy Ghost. That's all satanic insanity. Now, you give somebody a cup of cream, that's a that's real wealth. Now we're talking real wealth. Okay. The, these people on TV, Creeflo Dollar, Copeland, Jesse Duplacus, all these guys, they already have their reward. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees. You already have your reward. That's it right there. Okay. Your reward is being stored up in heaven with great treasures. Great treasures. Okay? Paul learned it. Jesus taught it. The great John the Baptist learned it. I mean, that guy, that guy had nothing. He died in prison. They chopped his head off. He didn't have a nickel to his name, but he had laid up enormous treasures in heaven. He had preached the glorious gospel of Christ. He preached the repentance gospel, and he baptized the one and only Holy Son of God. I tell you what, John, John the Baptist hit it big when he got to heaven. But here, the guy had nothing. Zero. Now, are you supposed to have zero? No, of course not. I'm not, I'm not. I'm making a different point here. I'm not telling you to take a vow of poverty. That's that's some satanic thing somebody came up with. Don't do that. Here, it's in your heart. Focus on your heart. Let go of it. Echo in the grip of let your stuff go. That's what he said to the rich young ruler. He didn't say it, tell him to go sell every single thing. He said, let go of it. Let go of it. And by doing that, you can show yourself that you let it go because it won't bother you to give it to the poor because you will recognize now you have treasures in heaven. You're loaded. You're loaded, friend. You didn't even know that, did you? You thought you were poor. You thought you were in debt. Well, you probably are poor and in debt in this world. But if you're letting go of these things and you're serving God with a good heart, God will provide your needs and you don't even need to pray about it. You literally don't even need to pray, pray about it. For my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Paul wasn't praying for it. He said, hey, it's all going to be supplied to me because I'm doing my father's business. That's what happened to Jesus. Jesus didn't sit around praying for money to pay my taxes. I need food. I need I need a new robe. My sandals are worn out. I need some more sandals. He never prayed for that stuff. There was no need to it. Father just gave it to him. Why? Because he was about his father's business. You don't have to do it. You can do the same thing. God, I need this. God, I need that. My kids need this. My kids need that. No, they don't. Father's got that covered. That's already covered. See these birds? Look at him, he set up a system to feed birds. Are you not more valuable than birds? Of course you are. For crying out, you are you are like precious to father. Birds are not. Birds are just birds. It's a bird. You are something incredibly valuable and very loved by God. Even that rich young ruler who called him a teacher and wouldn't acknowledge him as God and then walked off depressed. It said Jesus loved him. And you want to know something? <laughs> he loves you too.